This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. And welcome in, folks, to the second ever edition of Open Mic Night. I'm your host, Noah Taluki, and this week we're going to be taking a deep dive into the 2020 Tigers season. Baseball is finally back, folks. July 24th against the Reds, the first series for your Tigers. We're going to be looking at some potential starting lineups, also some impact players for this season, and what to expect for this season and what the long-term future should be for your Detroit Tigers. In case you missed it, last week was the first ever edition of Open Mic Night. We had a special guest, Matt Derry, on. And joining us later in the podcast to talk about this Tigers season will be the Tigers play-by-play man himself on the radio, Mr. Dan Dickerson. He'll give us a more of an in-depth look at the Tigers and share some of his memories with the team. In case you missed episode number one, I had Matt Derry on last week, so go check that out. We talked a lot about Lions, but this week we head across the street to Comerica Park, and we're going to be talking about the Tigers and what my expectations are for them for this 60-game season that starts Friday, July 24th against the Reds. That'll be a 6.10 p.m. start. I already have the countdown ready for that because I have been waiting for baseball for a long, long time here, and... Baseball is one of my favorite sports. I never played it as a kid or anything, but I just always enjoyed watching it. And I always enjoyed watching specifically the Tigers. And especially when I was just coming into my own as a sports fan, early 2010s, that was when they were getting pretty good. So I just fell in love with that team as soon as I started watching them with Verlander and Miguel Cabrera and going to the World Series in 2012. And I just kind of thought, this is just going to be the normal. This is the Tigers are going to be in World Series contention every year, but not anymore. Unfortunately, the Tigers have fallen on some hard times. And as a fan of the team, it upsets me, but I think that they have a good plan in store in the next coming years. A lot of great prospects on the team, especially from the likes of Casey Mize, Matt Manning, Tarek Scoob, a lot of good pitching. They need to pick up some of the bats, but they did draft some big bats in the last couple of seasons. Riley Green last year, Spencer Torkelson this year. So these are guys that I think could really step up in the coming years. But like I mentioned, 60 game season for the Tigers starting on July 24th. I'm going to run down sort of my projected starting lineup and then we'll kind of discuss from there. So I think Austin Romine at catcher, CJ Crone at first base, Jonathan Scope at second base, Nico Goodrum at shortstop, Jamer Candelario at third base, Kristen Stewart in left field, Jacoby Jones in center field, Cameron Mabin in right, and DHing will be Miguel Cabrera. Also, Dowell Lugo should see some time at shortstop and third base, and Victor Reyes should be seeing some time in left field or right field. So that is my projections for the starting lineups for the batters. And then when you go to the pitching, I think it'll be Matt Boyd, Michael Fulmer, Spencer Turnbull, Jordan Zimmerman, and Yvonne Nova. Nova, Romine, Crone, and Scope, those guys were all signed on one-year deals. So I don't expect these guys to be part of the rebuild. I think these are just pieces that Al Avila signed just to kind of fill holes. These are experienced MLB veterans, so I'm sure that they'll have some locker room presence as well. But really, when I look at this starting lineup, I don't see a lot of these guys as big-time performers for the future of this club. I think a lot of those guys are still playing in the minor leagues, obviously no minor leagues this season, but I think one player, if you look at this roster and you take away the prospects, I think one player to look out for this season is Miguel Cabrera. And Miggy is, let's face it, he's a shell of his old self. The Miguel Cabrera I grew up watching was 35 home runs, 120 RBIs, hitting for average, the triple crown winner. We're obviously not going to get that from Miguel anymore, but he's slimmer now that I hear. He's really happy, as Ron Gardenhire said. He's happiest he's ever seen him. And I think Mickey's role on the team now is just add to his milestones that he's been setting with home runs and RBIs and all that. And then he's more of like a locker room guy. I think the younger guys really would enjoy having him around just because of all the experience that he brings and and all the tips that he can give them in terms of hitting and all that. So I think that's Miguel's role right now on this team. And I think another player that really needs to have a bounce back season this year is Jamer Candelario. And as we all know, he got demoted to AAA last season to Toledo. 
He started the season when he was in that Cubs trade, when I believe just we shipped out Justin Wilson and Alex Avila, I believe in that trade. He came in and started right away, and he actually had a decent end of the season. And really, when you look back at it, as of now, that's the only trade that the Tigers have won. Of all those trades that Al Avila sent out to other teams and shipped out all the stars from the early 2010s, Jamer Candelario was really the guy who stood out in terms of the guys that the Tigers got back. But he had a, a really big slump last season, demoted to Toledo. Now he's back in the starting lineup. So he'll definitely have to have a bounce back year for sure if he wants to stick around any longer. But another player on this team that I think should be talked about a little bit more and I think who gets forgotten in the mix a lot is Michael Fulmer. He's coming back from Tommy John surgery, which is such a hit or miss injury because it deals with that pitcher's elbow, which is how the pitcher throws his pitches accurately and and effectively. And some guys you see, they'll come right up and they'll be studs. They'll be all-stars again, but there's guys that really lag behind, so we don't know about Fulmer. There's talk that they should have traded him away and, and all that before the injury even happened, and you know, look where we are now, but when you think about it, at the time, Fulmer had a very good arm, and nobody knew that he was going to have Tommy John surgery, but it seems like more and more pitchers now in the MLB are, are having that type of surgery, and a lot of them you see are succeeding after they have the surgery, so let's hope for the best that Michael Fulmer recovers from that and can throw effectively again, and you always have Matthew Boyd, who really shined last season. And then Jordan Zimmerman, this is the last year of his deal. If you want my opinion, I don't want him back. Him and Miguel Cabrera, if you look at the contracts, are the last really big contracts. They're the last sort of like Dave Dombrowski contracts. He was the guy that just paid like crazy for these stars, Prince Fielder and and a lot of those other ones back in the day. But Alavilla is tearing down, and I think once they get Zimmerman off, there'll be uh, more room for some of these prospects to come up, hopefully. But a big question I have for the Tigers this season, and I'm sure a lot of fans out there have this same question, is will we see Casey Mize, Matt Manning, Tarek Skubal, Spencer Torkelson, even maybe Riley Green, possibly? I I doubt that, though. Will we see any of these guys this season up? And here's my opinion. 60-game season, I think the Tigers should try and be competitive here. I think it's about time that you know, the losing starts to stop. And I see this season for the Tigers being basically like a longer spring training. However, I want them to be competitive and I I want them to try to win games. It's not about tanking, you know, getting a a higher draft pick and losing because this is already going to be a lost season. No, I think the Tigers should try to win. And especially now because 60 games, you know, you're you're cutting your season by more than a half. So anything can happen in a 60 game stretch. You never know. The Tigers could come out of nowhere and kind of, I, I could be crazy for saying it, but maybe it could be like the 06 team, you know, kind of comes out of nowhere, has all these grinders on the team who, who are working, but we'll have to see about that. That may be a little far-fetched, but still, I, I really want them to try and be competitive and also get the younger guys up. I think it's time that Casey Mize, Matt Manning to come up to the big league club. And I'm not saying at the beginning of the season, right on July 24th, I'm saying maybe work it way in, maybe when we get to the later days of August and and, and into September. But I think it's time that these guys get major league experience. And I know it's a really weird season already, but I mean, we're already in a pretty sports starved town right now in terms of success. And so we need some fresh life here in in Detroit and some fresh air. And I think that bringing up these prospects this season brings some fresh life to the Tigers. So I really hope that that happens. Not saying at the beginning of the season, but maybe later on. And my message here, if I were Al Avila, for the future of this team, because I think the Tigers could be competitive in the coming years for sure, especially with all the, the young talent that they have. I think once they get Zimmerman's contract out, or even Miggy's, they could start to spend big money again. And I know Dave Dombrowski was big with that, and and Al Avila is a a disciple of Dave, but the Tigers' biggest problem right now is finding bats. And I know they drafted some, which is great, and I'm hoping a lot of those guys pan out, but it would be nice to kind of get somebody like a Miguel Cabrera back way in his prime. You could pay a big amount of money because there's only two big contracts left. So I'm hoping in the coming years that the Tigers can spend big money on a couple bats that can get the Tigers competitive and help them with a good mix of veterans and the younger guys 
start to compete. But another question that when that comes up is, is Al Avila to be trusted with this? Because we saw that the Tigers didn't get a whole lot of trade value when Al Avila shipped out the stars. Like Verlander, we still have yet to see on Franklin Perez. He's been hurt so many times. And then Jake Rogers has just proven to be a defensive catcher. And Daz Cameron still hasn't really progressed maybe as much as the Tigers thought he would. So I think the Astros definitely got the the better end of that deal. And then, like I mentioned before, I think the only trade that the Tigers really have won so far is, is getting Jamer Candelario because Justin Wilson and Alex Avila, they didn't really do a whole lot for the Cubs. So at least Candelario had a nice stretch when the Tigers first got him. So I don't know if Al Avila is good at making the trades or anything, but Is he good at signing big name guys like Dave Dombrowski was? And that answer remains to be seen because the Tigers have not spent really that much on bigger guys since Al took over. So that question will be answered later on. But I think the Tigers really should be competitive this season and and try and try to win. Because I I don't like this idea of tanking and, and all that. So I really hope that they can compete and that we see the younger guys this season. So it it should be an exciting year. I'm ready for baseball to get back at Comerica Park. And it should be fun because I love me some Tiger baseball. And it's the boys of summer are back. So it'll be definitely fun for sure. Joining us now on Open Mic Night is Dan Dickerson, the play-by-play radio voice for the Detroit Tigers on 97 won the ticket for about 20 years now. Dan, how are you feeling now that uh, baseball is finally back? Uh, really good. No, it's good to be with you. Uh, it, it was funny the other day, you know, it's an inter-squad game and they, they took the field and I was down there and I just, I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> I'm getting excited for an inter-squad game. <laughs> so I'm just glad baseball is back. Oh yeah, for sure. But I just want to know, so you're so used to doing the whole sp- spring training bit for a while and then going into the regular season at Comerica, but a lot of that didn't happen this year. I just want to ask yeah. you, what was life like without baseball? in the last couple months? It was certainly different. It's been different for a lot of people. Um, and I just, um, you know, I, I can always fill my time during a day. My two grown children have been uh, at home for a good part of this. My son just graduated from Michigan State. My daughter's in grad school at Grand Valley State. And it's been a lot of extra time with them. And uh, there's no there's no downside to that. So that's really been uh, the plus out of this. You know, my son's going to be moving to California soon. So it's time with him that I wouldn't have otherwise gotten. And the same for my daughter, who would have been in Grand Rapids the whole time. And instead, she's been home. It's not her favorite for, <laughs> in terms of how to, how to attend grad school. But uh, it's been great to have them both, both home a lot. Oh, yeah, for sure. Family is very important. But you mentioned the inner squad scrimmages that you got really, really excited for uh, finally. So what has impressed you the most about those inner squad scrimmages while watching the team this last week? Yeah, I've seen a few of them. And I, I think the, the biggest thing is you realize there's some talent on this team and you're going to have to make some judgments about players based on an inner squad game, which is less than ideal. It's hard enough to do that with an exhibition game. Now we're probably level below that in terms of, you know, the intensity and how the game is is played out because they're pretty informal. But I think there's some real pluses to inner squad maybe versus exhibition. You've got young kids in camp who are, you know, around these major leaguers every day, even if they're in separate clubhouses. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're getting a chance to watch, as Riley Green said, watch Miguel Cabrera take batting practice in the cage, just watching and learning and for him and Spencer Torkelson and go right down the list, Mize and Manning and Scooble, any of these young players to be around these major leaguers. They may not, some are going to be in the major leagues this year, some are obviously not, but there's great value in being in this major league camp. And to watch a Kristen Stewart have a big day the other day, it means something. This kid's fighting for a job and he clearly took this time when baseball was shut down and applied some of the things that Joe Vavra had suggested for him to work on his swing because he had a tough spring and he felt like he was just getting it when baseball got shut down. So I think you see some talent, young talent that's on the way. You see the talent that's in camp. You realize this is a team that in a 60 game season, absolutely, if everything breaks right, absolutely has talent to hang in there because let's face it, 32, 33, 34 wins is probably going to grab that last playoff spot in either league. And could they do that in 60 games? I think they absolutely could. 
Oh, absolutely. I'm, I said it before. I'm cheering for them to, to win this year for sure. But I just wanted to ask you kind of like, in my opinion, the golden question among fans, you know, when is this team going to start to get back into that contention on a regular basis like you saw in the early 2000, the early part of the 2010s? You know, when is that part where maybe all the prospects will be up and they'll start to compete? Yeah, think of it. It was a really a, like a 10 year stretch where they were going into spring training, expected to be contenders or turned out to be contenders, you know, every year, even if they didn't reach the postseason. That was a long stretch from 2006, you know, really through 2015, because they went into 2015, at least as a thought of a contender. They didn't. But this is a team that is really putting some pieces together. It, it's, it's hard to put an exact timetable on it. I'm the eternal optimist, and I think that, you know, it could be sooner rather than later. A year of lost development is not the best thing for some of those prospects, and that's, again, why, why I think that Torkelson and Green and, and Dingler and guys like that who are in camp, that, that will help their development this year with no minor leagues. And then, you know, this year's draft could be a, a huge piece in terms of rebuilding this lineup. I mean, They've had a hard time finding that college hitter to be an impact bat, probably since Curtis Granderson. Think how long ago that was. And they, they might have legitimately three and four guys who could be major leaguers out of this year's draft. So the timetable, I'm thinking, I mean, it's going to be, I think it starts this year. I really do. But that's a 60-game season. As Matthew Boyd has said, you know, a young team over 162 usually get exposed. So over 162 games. I think you're looking at, you know, next year's certainly a building block. And then really after that, absolutely, they could be. I mean, I'm not even going to put any limits on 2021. People have to realize there are five Tiger prospects who are now ranked in the top 50 by consensus in all of Major League Baseball. You've got five in the top 100. That's pretty good. But you've got five in the top 50 by consensus in Mize Manning, Scoobal, Riley Green, and Spencer Torkelson. That's and, and so really that can speed up the timetable in a hurry if they all start making the major leagues in the next couple of years. That's why I'm not going to put any limits on it. Let's just say it's going to be really interesting starting this year and then building in the years ahead. Sustainable contention is what exactly what Alavila and his staff want to build, not just success for one or two years. And I think we're going to start seeing it next year. And after that, you know, to me, this is a team that can absolutely contend in 2022, 2023. Well, that's uh, that's music to all of our ears, I guess, uh, if you will, uh, for for our, uh, the fans out there listening. But I just want to ask you a little bit about your career. You worked with Ernie Harwell uh, towards the end of his career. What was it like to work with such a legendary broadcaster in Detroit and really throughout baseball, and then take over for him? What, what was that feeling like as well? Well, he, uh, he had a huge influence on on my career in many ways. I mean, growing up listening to him, I think certainly. You know, it had an influence on my style of calling a baseball game. I, I listened to him. I liked the way he called the game. I incorporated some of those things. We're two different people. But, you know, I incorporated some of those things into how I call a game just by osmosis, probably, right? I mean, you go to bed with Ernie on and fall asleep when he's on those West Coast games. It just it gets in you. So uh, he, he was amazing. I mean, you think it might be intimidating to work with someone of that stature, uh, one of the greatest broadcasters of all time, but he just had that knack. And this was whether he met someone for the first time or, you know, welcoming a young broadcaster into the booth, but putting you at ease and just making you feel very relaxed around him. I had zero baseball experience calling baseball professionally when I got the job in 2000, other than one inning of play-by-play in the last game at Tiger Stadium, thanks to Ernie Harwell. So, he had an influence on my career in ways large and small. I remember, you know, I'd gotten to know him a little bit. I mean, not a lot, but enough, I guess. I guess probably a lot of fans feel this way. Enough to feel like I could call him and say, will you listen to my tape? A tape that I had made sitting in an empty booth, uh, in the third deck down the left field line at Tiger Stadium. Uh, booths that had not been used, by the way. They were all the old football broadcast booths. So they hadn't been used since the Silverdome opened in the mid-70s. And he invited me over to his house and, you know, had and listened to my tape with me. And I still have the notes from that meeting somewhere in this house to this day. Just simple things like the ball's not down low, it's low. You know, just one last word. But again, every word matters. You want to tighten things up. Use two different colors of ink on your scorebook. Blue for the outs, red for any time a runner reaches base. So that when you're reviewing the game for your listeners, you quickly identify where the base runners have been or have not been, if it's a really well-pitched game. So little things like that. I I always use the same color, two different colors, 
you know, changes everything. So uh, just the fact that he invited me over to this day always was, I think, so cool. And secondly, that he gave me an inning of play-by-play last game at Tiger Stadium. I don't think there's any question that helped get me into the booth the next year as a middle innings guy. And then to watch him in action, you know, he grew up in an era when I'm a stats guy. I love the numbers of this game. And I'm so glad I grew up in an age when Bill James was changing the way we think about how to analyze baseball players. And so I love all of that. He grew up in an era where there wasn't much of it beyond batting average in ERA. <laughs> and so, I mean, he really made an effort every day to go talk to people and get their stories. And it was a great reminder for me that it's always most interesting, the story behind the numbers and the person behind the numbers. And it was just, uh, it was amazing to watch him walk into a visiting clubhouse and see the manager's eyes light up when he walked in. He'd always say, hi, Ernie Harwell. I mean, like he had to introduce himself, right? <laughs> but that was Ernie. And so to watch him, you understood uh, how much he loved being at the ballpark and why he sounded just as good in that last game in Toronto as he did probably throughout his career. Wow, that's that's awesome. Long gone and, and the voice of the turtle and so many, so many great calls that uh, yeah. Ernie really had uh, stood there by the side of the road. Uh, all those <laughs> just very, very memorable uh, in Tiger history. But last question here I want to get to you is, um, do you have, I wanted to know, what was your favorite Tiger memory that you've had? And I know that there, you've called plenty of games in your career, but is there one that, that sticks out to you on the air or maybe just a favorite game that you ever called? I think that, you know, the postseason is, th- those games are just amazing. It's just, you know, you get the regular season and then the, the postseason is, it's just a whole nother level of intensity and, you know, focus because every pitch means so much and it's just a blast. So obviously the 2006, you know, beating the Yankees was phenomenal. The Tigers had gone into that series having lost 31 of their last 50 games after their incredible start. They ended up winning two fewer games than the Yankees. But you go to New York, and literally we had a Yankee announcer say, seriously, do you guys think you have a chance in this series? I mean, literally, 95-win team, 97-win team, nobody thinks the Tigers have a chance. When they get rained out, Jim Leland makes a joke of it that I got outmanaged on a day we got rained out in game two. And then when Joel Zamaya comes out, and those five batters that he faced that was on recently – Game two, 2006, in Yankee Stadium. Shadows might have helped them out, but you just remember how electric Joel Samaya was for that one year, tragically one year. But that's like a favorite moment because that turned that whole series around. Then they go back to Detroit and take two from the Yankees. And then, of course, the Maglio home run. But I think some of my favorite games, the Kenny Rogers game, which was game three of that Yankee series, a favorite. 2012 and 13, when Justin Verlander won game five in Oakland, back-to-back years, those Oakland crowds, now they've never been known for attendance, but those Oakland crowds, they have tarps in the upper deck of the old Oakland Coliseum because they just block them off because nobody sits, they don't fill up the stadium. They took those tarps off one year. That place was rocking, as loud as I've heard anywhere. And Justin Verlander, back-to-back years in game five, and then I think in 2012, Oakland had all the momentum because they'd taken the last two. I mean, I think he ends up going in the two games, 16 innings, gives up, you know, one run or two runs, and the Tigers win two game fives on the road in division series in 2012 and 2013. Those were phenomenal. I mean, that's just greatness, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's just greatness rising to the challenge, and that's why I love watching that guy pitch. The, the greatest ones rise to the moment, and he certainly did those two years. Then another favorite moment to me is a, a great example of, of what Ernie told me early in my career when I was struggling with a losing team. He said, you know, what do you do when you have a, a crappy team? And he said, just remember, somebody's always listening. Give them a reason to listen to the game that day. And remember that a great moment is still a great moment. I, I think that's, you know, we all know that. But some people, I've seen people wonder through the years, why does a team that's 30, 40, 50 games under 500 celebrate a walk-off home run? Because every game matters, you know? Just, that's, what are they supposed to do? So one of my favorite moments is in 2003, a great example of a great moment a great moment. It's August. They're on their way to losing 119 games. They are, think about this, 60 games under 500 in August. They're playing the Angels. The Angels were good. They were the world champions the year before. They're down 9-8 in the bottom of the ninth. And facing Troy Percival, who had absolutely killed the Tigers in his career. He was dominant, closer. 
I think he'd given up. We looked it up. I, I want to say two or three runs in 44 innings in his career against the Tigers. Brandon Ainge is at the plate. He's hitting 190. There's a man on, one out, two outs. I mean, it's hopeless. They're down a run, but it's it's Troy Percival on the mound. And he hits a walk-off home run. And, you know, it's just the joy with these guys. They'd lost 11 in a row at that point. The joy, you realize how hard they've been working for just one win that whole year. And it was just a great moment. And it was a great reminder that that's why we love baseball. Wow, that, that, that's, a, that's a great memory. And it's really, I, I remember those uh, 2012, 2013 with Verlander on the mound, like, like it was yesterday, really. And, and, yeah. you, and you were the guy I was listening to. So it's, uh, it was <laughs> awesome. It's a, it's a great, great feeling. But uh, we want to thank uh, Dan Dickerson for coming on, of course, the play-by-play radio voice for the Detroit Tigers on 97 won the ticket. Dan, thank you so much for your time. No, I enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. Wow, what an awesome interview that was with Dan Dickerson. He's a very respected broadcaster around the Detroit community and does a tremendous job with the Tiger broadcast along with his partner, Jim Price. I mean, they were guys that I just grew up listening to and in awe of, really. And Dan is so knowledgeable about the game of baseball and has so many memories. It's, it was just awesome to listen to, and it was a real treat to be able to interview him. So that was an awesome opportunity. And... One story that I wanted to share really quickly before we close out, it reminded me when he was talking about the old transmitter radios that he would listen to back in the day to Ernie Harwell. It made me think of one of my favorite moments listening to Dan and Jim was I I was on a service trip once through high school and during the trip we could not use our phones. But one of the adult leaders had presented us the score of the Tigers Rays game back in June of 2016 and the Tigers were down by about seven runs And then they came back and scored eight runs in the ninth inning. I've never seen anything like it to this day. And they won the game. And one of the adults let us listen to Dan and Jim on the radio. And it just seemed like with every hit, they were just getting more and more excited, thinking, yes, there could be a comeback in store. And sure enough, there was. So that was an awesome, awesome story. And I'll never forget that, listening to to Dan and Jim, one of my favorite memories with them for sure. I want to thank the Detroit Sports Podcast for airing this episode of Open Mic Night. And they have a bunch of other cool podcasts like Doc and Jock, the Wrestling Podcast, the Fan Report, the Michigan Football Podcast, a lot of those that you can check out on their website. Awesome. It's 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 really cool. There's a lot of great content out there and they do a great job. So thank you again so much folks for tuning in to this week and tune in next week for some more Detroit Sports Talk only on Open Mic Night.